So I think uh, monoprinting, because it's such a painterly process, it was a really nice gateway into the printed mark. Hello, print friends, and welcome to the 77th episode of Pine Copper Lime, the internet's number one printmaking podcast. I'm your host, Miranda Metcalf. I release weekly podcasts with people in the print world who are doing something a bit beyond the expected. So please subscribe on your podcast listening app of choice. You can also find Pine Copper Lime on Instagram and Facebook, and you can sign up for our monthly newsletter with print news from around the world all at pinecopperlime.com. We also have a Patreon page where supporters can join up at tiers starting at just a dollar a month, and they all help us to keep bringing you printmaking content every week. You can also get thank yous like stickers and totes, so if that sounds like something you're interested in, you can look at the link in the show notes. It's also completely, totally fine if you don't want to know more about that because life is weird, times are tough, there's a global pandemic, and uh, maybe you just want to listen to this show and enjoy what you hear and not worry about it. So we want you to do just that. Hey, print friends, we have merch. We're talking printmaking jokes, the Pine Copper Lime logo, and now, by popular demand, a shun the non-believers design, which, if I do say so myself, might be my favorite thus far. It's even available in colors. Check it out now. Link in the show notes. And one more quick bit of housekeeping. In case you don't already know, we're archiving past Pine Copper Lime episodes on YouTube for your easy listening, close captioning, and sharing with people who think that YouTube is better than SoundCloud. Printmaking forever. Shun the non-believers. Pine Copper Lime is brought to you by Speedball Art Products, who've been offering a diverse range of high-quality products to your creative practice since 1997. But we all know those products do not use themselves. That's why Speedball works with a fantastic lineup of contemporary printmakers who make up the Speedball team of demo artists. Artists like Alex Carmona, whose imagery inspired by motorcycles and automobiles led him to collaboration with Fender and releasing the very first handcrafted wood Telecaster. Alex's favorite products are Speedball's professional relief inks and fabric inks, which he finds to be the most consistent and easy to use, easy cleanup on the market today. So if you want to learn a few tricks of the trade, head on over to Speedball's YouTube channel and see how it's done. There's a link in the show notes. My guest this week is Gemma Gunning. Gemma is a Bristol-based printmaker who has taken on starting her own studio in the middle of a pandemic. In this episode, we talk about art on pub chalkboards, chance encounters with monotypes when all you thought you were after was the toilet, the grit of a first-generation college student exploring urban landscapes, and a little place called Bunny Island. So, without further ado, sit back, relax, and prepare to explore the forgotten places with Gemma Gunning. Hi Gemma, how's it going? Hey Miranda, it's good, thank you. How are you? I'm really good. Thank you for joining me on your lunch break, it sounds like. No, thank you for inviting me. I've been looking forward to this all day. Excellent, excellent. Well, I'm really excited to dive in and learn more about you and what it is that you do. But before we get started, would you please let listeners know who you are and where you're currently located and how it is you describe what it is that you do? So uh, I'm Gemma Gunning. I am a printmaker based in Bristol, which is in southwest of England. I primarily specialise in intaglio and lithographic processes, and I kind of do my work in a studio that I've just recently set up with two other printmakers called Bristol Print Atelier. And alongside my practice, I work as a technical instructor at the University of the West of England in the Lifeway Studio. So. I'm really fortunate that I'm one of those people that get to basically live and breathe um, ink and printmaking. Yeah, absolutely. And so where did you grow up and what role did art play in that part of your life? So uh, I grew up in uh, Royal Witton Bassett, which is a small town in Wiltshire. And I grew on the outskirts, but 
well, we lived on the outskirts of the town. So most of my childhood was spent kind of climbing on hay bales, kind of wandering the landscape. And I was always drawing as a child. It's kind of that cliche, you know, I was kind of from the age, as, as small as I can remember, I was drawing kind of what was around me. And parents aren't creative as such in terms of art. My mum used to do quite a lot of knitting and my nan was also a knitter. So I used to spend my weekends and kind of school holidays with my nan knitting jumpers and blankets for Mm. children in Africa, which was, you know, a lovely way to kind of pass time. Uh, So, yeah, the arts, I would always, you know, for Christmas or birthdays, ask for a new set of pencils or some new crayons. Uh, So I was encouraged to draw and be creative as a child, Um, even though none of my family really are, none of them work in the arts. A bit of a black sheep of the family, <laughs> but it sounds like that they were that they were very supportive though of what you were doing, even though if it wasn't something that that they necessarily took on themselves. Yeah, completely. Yeah, really supportive. That's wonderful. Mm. And so then, did you end up going to art school? Yeah. So I, throughout my education, I've always chosen creative subjects over the more academic ones. Um, so I did an art foundation after A level and. I chose fine art and I was mainly painting and drawing at the time and after my art foundation I really I really didn't know whether I wanted to go to university to pursue arts and I am one of the one well, the only person in my family to have actually gone and done a BA um, or an MA in fact so it was a bit alien to consider the fact of going to university. So I took about two, three years out after my found art foundation and I worked in a restaurant and I did a management program. So I was assistant manager and then I did relief management in other pubs. And I got to about, I must have been 21, 22, and I was like, what am I doing? Like, <laughs> I'm working 60 odd hours weeks and having no job satisfaction. And the only thing that brought me joy was drawing and writing on the blackboards like the specials Mm. so um I decided to enroll and do a BA in in drawing and I remember at the time you know my family being like what are you doing what what would a drawing degree get you I'm like I have no idea but I just want to you know kind of advance my skill set learn how to draw and be introduced to other kind of creative processes so yeah I did three years drawing degree and that is when I found printmaking and it kind of just changed my whole my whole life because it opened up this whole new realm of making that was really exciting and intuitive which I think you don't often get with painting or drawing you know there's so many possibilities with the printed mark and that's yeah that's kind of my route into to print really. Yeah it was interesting what you're saying how you found the printed mark actually to be more of an intuitive process because I think sometimes people think of it as the other way because you get the immediacy with painting I think people sometimes think oh like I can just respond I don't have to plan but it sounds like you had the opposite experience did I hear that right yeah so what actually what actually got me into printmaking was it was a very serendipitous moment I went into Somerset House in London just to use the toilet and (laughs) as I left I was greeted by these huge, what I thought were paintings by John Virtue. And when I inspected them closer and read the little label, it was a a monotype. And I was like, what is a monotype? Mm. Like, wow. So I went back to my tutor and I was like, you know, what's what's a monoprint? What's a monotype? Um, He demonstrated. And I was like, oh, my God, I can can layer and I can, you know, use colour. And so I think uh, monoprinting, because it's such a painterly process, it was a really nice gateway into the printed mark. It's kind of like the little, you know, the little drug that hooks you into printmaking. Yeah, yeah. I think everyone has that story of, of that one process. Because it's so, it's so interesting. Because, you know, printmaking gets put under the um, this umbrella both in things like this podcast, in the way that it gets organized institutionally, in the wings of different museums. But really, you know, someone who truly loves wood carving may not have any interest whatsoever in lithography. 
You know, it's like the processes are so different that I think we do need to see nest sometimes that that one little hook, that one little carrot on the stick that kind of lets us like follow it in. And then the whole world opens up and we might go take different paths once we're in there. Completely. Um, And I I agree with that because, you know, you just said woodcut and wood cut is something that I'm definitely not interested in and it is those more painterly approaches because I've come from you know um, I guess a painterly background yeah um, woodcut lino is definitely not my realm of printing yeah and that's yeah I was thinking about that because it the act of carving is so different from the act of etching from the act of etching a stone from the act of monotype they're all so different and so yeah when you sound you're saying you're the the first generation in your family to go to college how did you kind of go about that process? Because that's always interesting to me because, you know, people I know who who are first generation college graduates, a lot of times they just looked around and they were like, I know this is what I want to do, but I don't know how I want to go do it because I don't have someone who will, you know, stay up with you until midnight the night before making sure that you've signed all the different places on the form and all of that, you know, the people who maybe parents or an older sibling uh, went to uni. Yeah, that's it's interesting because so my parents were, you know, they said, you know, okay, we we support you, you know, if you want to go and do a degree, that's fair enough, but um, they're not in that financial position to be able to support. So I say, well, I'm going to make this work. So you know, you, you kind of have to believe in yourself to mm. make it work and actually to prove people wrong that, you know, you can get a job in the arts and you can be successful if you put your mind to it. And, you know, it's that drive and hard work has paid off. But yeah, it was having to really research and really understand the process. And because I did go to university a bit later, my friends who took that, you know, mm. I guess that traditional route after Art Foundation they had been through it so I did have friends to fall back on to be like how do I fill this form out or right. you know I don't understand about um student loans or you know right plants. ah yeah um, so luckily I had friends who had already gone to university and who could help with those the nitty-gritty of the application yeah it makes such a huge difference completely huge and my tutors at my tutors were amazing so you know they were really supportive and any queries I had they were there so um I was really fortunate that we had really good tutors and technicians that you could just go and ask and talk to which yeah you make you grow and and a guide which I guess a good teacher does absolutely and so you were saying that the first printmaking process that really caught your eye that drew you in you know were these giant monotypes so when you started out in printmaking did you start making monotypes and that was sort of you know your own introduction into your practice yeah completely so um, alongside the monotypes I was kind of monotyping um, from exploring urban environments so I would take a sketchbook and I would draw and from my drawings I would come back to the print studio and make a series of monotypes and they were quite quick expressive and they were actually quite abstract and from those monotypes I then started cutting them all up and kind of collaging and drawing on top and painting on top which then led me down the route of collagraphs so for my BA I ended up doing a lot of Mono printing that then kind of went through a whole process to create these kind of semi abstract collagraph plates that were looking at the impact that we have and the traces we have in the landscape, and um, particularly in urban environments. And these plates, they become quite big, and I ended up casting them. So, what was kind of quite a papery or well, cardboard substrate then become a, a physical 3D product and they were made to go on the floor with paper um, suspended above them so they become a dialogue between the fragility of what I was recording and the substrates that the environment is made from. So when you say casting them you, are you casting them in bronze or are you casting them in what what kind of casting? I'm inking the plate up and then I'm pouring a substance called herculite on top which is kind of it gives you the fine 
detailing of plaster, but it's the strength of concrete. So they are kind of these solid blocks that have then the intaglio print on the surface. Um, and I would also then include materials of the place that they have been drawn from. So the location, I will then gather kind of materials found on the streets of the city and mm. embed them into the crafts. And so they become quite tactile. And this is kind of what um, I loved about making holographs that I could use really accessible and cheap materials to make um, a printing block from. So I would often go and raid, you know, people's recycling bins, um, looking for really interesting materials that resonate with the urban environment and the textures and marks found in those spaces. Uh, so that's kind of how, yeah, what I ended up doing for three years on my BA was just exploring monoprinting and holograph printing, which kind of introduced me to Intaglio. I associate your work now with these just extremely inky inky rich intaglio plates yeah so I, I was introduced to like proper etching so in the college I was in we did um it's not like it's not proper etching but we use a non-toxic ground and we did we used copper sulfate with aluminium and it was okay but it wasn't ever it didn't really spark my kind of the alchemic side because you had it was quite a faff you had to bake the plate in the in an oven and and the results are always a bit unpredictable. And it wasn't until I did an internship at London Print Studio mm. that I was introduced to copper plate and ferric chloride. And that's when kind of this spark for etching really kind of come to life. It, you know, seeing the plate kind of be manipulated and decaying in an acid was just like, wow, this is <laughs> insane. Yeah, And the fact that those really rich blacks with an aquatint, which I hadn't previously experienced before. And that was when I got into um, Intaglio printmaking, was doing the internship at LPS. And it was also where I saw proper, you know, people printmaking all the time. And I was like, wow, people are printmaking and earning a living. I want to do that. <laughs> How do I do that? Right, right. <laughs> I want to do that. <laughs> Yeah, so that was kind of a real pivotal moment of, of I guess, my career after uh, graduating from my BA was seeing that people were doing this full time and it can be done. And now I'm doing it, which is, yeah, it feels great to, I'm looking back 10 years from now, when we're like, why are you going to go do a BA in drawing? And it's like, well, look at what you can do with the arts. You know, people, there's a lot of work, I feel like at the moment, you know, the arts are being cut left, right, centre in education. And it's really sad to see because the arts is everywhere. You know, just, you know, you're drinking out of a coffee cup. Yeah. Somebody has made this who's come probably from a foundation course and has designed it. And, and to think that all that is being cut because it's not seen necessary is a real shame. Yeah, I think that that's such a significant point that people just don't to think of what the arts actually gives them in their day-to-day -day basis they think oh arts that's some old dead white guys paintings in a museum that I never see who needs that yeah. and you yeah. know one of the things that I've said on this podcast maybe once or twice before but I think it still rings true is well yes I understand that we're cutting budgets because of COVID and everything but like Try to get through your lockdown without art. Try to get through your lockdown without movies and books and TV shows and, you know, your uh, friends posting what they've created on Instagram. Like, it would not go well. Like, art is what we need. It's what keeps us ticking. And, and just looking at your phone, that has been designed, and mm. you know, from an art background. And absolutely. It's necessary in our kind of, creative like just our well-being you know being mm. able to access some means to art it's just so important well and it's interesting to hear your history I would say with the monotype because you know while I was saying like your intaglio works are so deep inky black rich they have a painterly quality to them as well uh in some of the way that the black and the grays and the tonals interact with each other there's almost sort of a brushwork in it do you think that that comes from that that background that you have and that first sort of early love 
of printmaking or is it something that kind of found its way to your work another way? It's completely how I work. So when I when I come across a site, I depending if I'm safe on a in a location, then I will set a draw. And then I'll go back to the studio and I'll make a series of monotypes before I even start working on a copper or, or a stone. And those monotype, those marks then find their way into the intaglio work. So it's kind of bringing bringing the painting into an etching. And that's why I love, you know, intaglio printmaking is the use of like sugar lift to create those painterly marks and spit bite to create the almost watercolour washes. It is a really magical medium that can allow you to have those painterly qualities. And yeah, you know, it allows it allows those mergers of tones and the, the rich blacks and it's well, it's just yeah, it's just brilliant. Mm. It's such a brilliant medium and versi- versatile at the same time. And I've just recently started um, using uh, LIFO crowns as stop outs to give it more of a drawing feel and quality. Oh, interesting. Yeah, you kind of it's it's, it's a it gives you a really unique kind of aesthetic quality, almost like a soft brown drawing, but yeah. you've made it an appetite. And I'm really enjoying working in that way because it's a lot, it's really freeing. You don't, you know, with, um, although it's, it's lovely doing like, um, you know, stopping out with a brush, it's a completely different look to the plate. Yeah. I was like, like you said that I was like, is she allowed to do that? Can she, can she can she mix the mix the mediums? Is she she's a she's a witch? Um. I think that I mean it's, it's it's always joked that when you when you start going into etching or lithography, it's the dark side of printmaking, and mm. there is this real mystifying magical moments where you know even when I do stone life now, I'm just like wow, what has just happened? Even though I understand the process inside out, there's still this. It's still this like kind of baffling moment where you're like, yeah, yeah, I've just etched a stone and now, and now I'm putting water on it and I'm rolling it with ink, and it's just sticking where I've drawn. Like that is magic. It's magic every it's time. Tough. Like it really is. It really is. It just you and you look at it and you're like, but it's smooth. How is it sticking to anything? And then it transfers to paper. Like what? It's so strange. Yeah. For sure. It's definitely, definitely seems like a magic trick. And I think that it's just, it takes a little bit too long, I think, for an audience to fully hold its attention in Vegas. But if they could, it, it would be very impressive, I'm sure. I was just going to say that at UE, I, I am, when I teach, it's mainly kind of photo plate work. But when you develop a plate and there's that moment where you pour the developer on and the plate goes purple, and then your image appears. This, like I always say to the students, like now get your phones out because you're gonna want to record this <laughs> right. to look back on and be like, oh my god, what has just happened? And that's kind of the the basic form of you know stone lithography. There's just like alchemy going on, and I think that is what grips people when um, you know you you get introduced to a process. And it's those little magical moments that you're like, okay, I can do this because I know that leading to that, there's going to be a moment of just pure joy. Mm. And I think that is what happens with stone and plate work. Yeah, I agree. It has that revealed moment, that kind of magic moment that never gets old. I don't, I, you know, I've talked to people who have been master printers for 60 years and they say it's exciting every time you go to lift up the sheet of paper, every time. Yeah. So it's good work to be in. <laughs> of anticipation of knowing that what you've done has been a success or not until yeah you kind of start peaking and revealing that print and nobody knows what it looks like until you start lifting that paper mm. which yeah is it's again it's those these kind of pure moments of joy that keeps you doing it and through all the through all the tears for the ones that didn't work out as well yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so in terms of your subject matter, you've touched on it a couple of times talking about urban decay, and it sounds like it's a subject that's been with you for quite some time. And you were talking a little bit about how it has to do with the way that, that humans uh, affect the world and interact with it. But how did you come to this subject, particularly now, given that you sort of grew up as a country girl, it sounds like? So, um, so yeah, as I was saying, on my BA, it was looking at it was more like to do with mark making so on the drawing degree it was you know 
we could be quite conceptual with what a drawing was. So, you know, coffee mark on a table. So I was then looking into the environment of marks that have been made by human presence and the traces of the humans. So whether it was graffiti or whether it had somebody who had scored their name into brickwork. And I started to record all of this in a sketchbook and noticing that I was drawn and fascinated with decay, the, the, the way like a billboard has layers and layers and layers of history. And, you know, they're peeling off and you kind of getting a portal into that past. And so I've kind of always had this love of texture and decay. And when I moved to Bristol five years ago, um, to do my MA, I I kind of always, when I'm in a new place, I would just walk and explore the streets. And I started noticing more and more industrial spaces, just because we're in a city, there's, there's more of those buildings. And a lot of them are abandoned and, you know, they contain, they're, they're like a visual playground mm. for all kinds of to mix and mingle so you've got the graffiti artists you've got the urban explorer and um, photographers and I've become interested in these spaces that are almost in limbo you know they've been left to decay and to fall into complete disrepair and on the other hand nature is completely reclaiming and mm-hmm. kind of thriving in these spaces so I was getting this kind of visual overload and stimulation between kind of conflict in these areas and there was one space in particular that kind of set off this interest was an old jail behind there's a place called M Shed in Bristol on the harbour and it was this weird kind of form that looked like a fragmented tooth and it was just kind of jutting out of the landscape and um, I managed to get inside and I started doing some drawing and photographing And there was this really weird kind of like eerie quality to the building. So I went to the Bristol Record Office and I started doing some research on the location. And it turned out that it used to be a gatehouse to an old prison. Um, But the gatehouse also doubled up as an execution platform. So where I was happily drawing, photographing, having a lovely time, you know, 100 years ago, hundreds of people had been hung and murdered. And it was this weird, like nobody knows that, this build what this building's history is so I started making a whole series of etchings and lithographs of this one particular place turned into um, an artist's book and that then sparked this interest and just keep on exploring keep on discovering these spaces that people just walk past every day and don't give a second thought Mm. or kind of consider what they were used for Bristol is developing really rapidly in the five years I've been here The buildings that were left to decay and were abandoned have now been turned into flats or commercial property. So I've had to go outside of the city now. So I purposely will, you know, go on websites for urban explorers to search out locations, um, particularly interested in um, ones that have a real historic or social significance. Mm -hmm. So almost seeing myself as kind of a documentary artist, somebody who's recording our heritage before it's lost from the landscape. And, um, you know, researching back into the history of the ruin, um, you've got artists like, you know, Giovanni Piranesi's etching, as he was recording right. the, the antiques in Rome because he couldn't foresee a future for these, these buildings that were in ruins. Um, and I guess it's kind of the similar, I, you know, I don't see a future for these these abandoned spaces because they are just completely you know they're they're demolished and you know quite frankly cheap shit buildings Mm -hmm. are kind of put in their place you know we're not repurposing which is a real shame because that history is then lost and every city ends up looking the same it's you know it's not whereas you know you know victorians the way they built their cities and the way they built the buildings were unique to whatever craft or manufacturing would be will be produced in that building. I can go to a city and just, it often feels like the same city as what I've just come from. Yeah, you know, I think part of that is just the globalization of aesthetic that is happening with the fact that we are communicating visually at such a rapid rate that you even look at something like fashion and 
you know, the, the curators in Bangkok are wearing the same outfits as the curators in Seattle, you know? <laughs> and I'm sure yeah. 25 years ago, I wouldn't have found that when I moved here. And I think that that's also happening in our architecture to a certain extent, I think, in our visual art as well. Although you do see, you know, certain certain trends at different times in different places. But there's a sameness that's that's coming to the world, particularly visually. And so, you know, my apartment complex that I live in right now in Bangkok, it could truly be anywhere in the world. It's a new, newer apartment complex, probably in the last, definitely in the last five years, maybe in the last three years it was built. It's just clean cubes, minimalist, yeah. clean cubes. And big windows to let in light and that's about it you know I I could I could be just about anywhere an elevator and a swimming pool and fair enough I mean maybe the swimming pool means it's somewhere warm I guess maybe (laughs) but it almost gives you know the these places then end up feeling quite soulless because they are just the same and you know concrete glass and where's the character and I suppose the people then make it the place rather mm. than the architect making the place. But yeah, completely understand where you're coming from there. And I like the you know, the clean white cube. Very, you know, almost like every place is trying to be a gallery. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and it's interesting that you should bring up Piranesi because I was thinking about stories that I'd heard about the decay of the kind of ruins that Piranesi was documented. And maybe they're apocryphal or maybe they're not, but that it's, you know, so for instance, something like the Colosseum didn't fall into ruin. People started dismantling it because the stones were already quarried because they just, they didn't see it as this important thing to be saved. And now it's this incredible artifact that people dream about going to see that I'm sure is one of the most visited sites in the world back when we could visit sites in this world. And it's, they sure they felt the same way about it that we feel about, you know, a McMansion falling into ruin or something like that, that there's, what's the point of kind of saving it. And it's this really interesting things with humans where the recent history doesn't matter to us. It's the right. ancient history that we just fawn over. But it's almost like if there's anyone who's alive who remembers it, we can throw it out. And it's something that humans have just done forever. We love the ancient history. We're not too fond. We don't care very much for recent history. Right. And I I often think about, you know, the the future and you know what will our ruins look like in say 100 years time or not not necessarily ruins but abandoned spaces because the building materials that we're using whether they they have longevity in them and therefore what what will our society look like will it just be shards of glass everywhere and thinking of the future of the planet and this kind of like dystopian landscape it is a really interesting question because of course we ain't building things like they built the Colosseum no more. <laughs> you know? yeah. they, we're not stacking stones on top of one another. It is pretty cheap. It is pretty quick, the way things go up. So what, yeah, what that'll look like is a really, is a really interesting question. I think that we've got some hints of it in, you know, places like Chernobyl, yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Do you do you have like a dream spot to go sketch and make art from? You know, so like like your your ideal urban decay that you could get to at some point or is it is it the unknown places that hold more of an interest for you? I would love to go to America and Detroit to see those massive industrial spaces. And mm-hmm. um, I think they would be visually I can just see them working visually as like an etching or a lithograph. And in terms of the UK, I do have like a list of places to visit. And because people know the kind of line of work that I'm interested in, I will often get people send me random locations like, hey, did you know that there's an abandoned building here? And it's like, no, that looks epic. <laughs> so I've got, it's like almost too much, too many places to visit and record. But yeah, I just going to a place and just being surprised about what I find in there. And the most recent, there's been a, a recent place I went to, it's called Kumkoat Works, and it's in the Welsh Valleys. 
and it's the door had just been left like locked and they had walked away so there's I think it shut in 2002 so in in the 20 what 18 years it's been left abandoned there's still machinery in there that hasn't been removed or touched mm-hmm. there's bandsaws there's laves there's you know the workers boots and hats and paperwork so when you go into a space like that all these narratives just come to mind and you start questioning who were these people that were here how did they feel when they were working here yeah. it's all these narratives that come to mind which then when you come to make the work it's kind of the driving force behind it the emotion and the turmoil you felt when you were in the space you know the state of flux it's in one of the most interesting vacations that I ever took was to an island off the south coast of Japan called Bunny Island. Yes. Yeah. And so it's it's tame rabbits because they've just been breeding for 60 years with no natural predators and abandoned poison gas factories. <laughs> oh. <laughs> because the, the sad story behind it is that the island was used for making poison gas in World War II, and the rabbits were tested on. And then um, at the end of the war, they just closed the doors to the factories and just let all the rabbits out that they had. And so they've just been, and they, they, they definitely have like a look, like you can tell that the gene pool's been limited for a while. They've got these really kind of long, funny faces and long feet, even for rabbits. And it was... Demon. Yeah, it was just such a surreal experience to walk around these old factories. And of course, they've taken out all the dangerous things by now uh, because they're letting tourists on there. There's a boat that goes there in a rabbit themed hotel and you can stay there overnight. And it's now a, a tourist attraction. But to walk around in abandoned poison gas factories with tame rabbits hopping about at your feet it's surreal. It's it's very surreal. It's very surreal, and I I don't know. Maybe that maybe you can add that one to your list. I think that you could probably yeah. make some good work from that. Oh, that would be yeah, funny to see. Yeah, um, there was, I went I went once to uh, an abandoned water park in Denmark, Ooh. and that was very strange, very eerie. We went really early, so about half seven in the morning, so that the sunlight was just about rising, and it was so again it's very surreal because you're in this part where hundreds of families would have been having a lovely time um, in the summer and you've got these big flutes that are you know covered in moss and decaying and again very spooky kind of place and very eerie Um, but you know it's, it's really fun kind of exploring these these locations. Is there an element of danger involved at all just sort of hearing you talk about it obviously if you are somewhere alone as a Mm. woman in an urban place that can be a bit dangerous but then also just the physical structures maybe aren't necessarily stable or haven't been stabilized in any way do you think about that is that something that comes into your practice I do think about that quite a lot and I always try and find a willing friend to come with me um, so that I'm not alone mm. if anything was to happen. Um, and I've been quite lucky that, you know, nothing has happened when I've been into spaces. Um, occasionally there might be another person in the space, but generally they are doing the same as you are. They just want to explore and they'll leave you to it. Um, but yeah, that does often come to my mind. And mm. more recently, I've been trying to get permission from developers and because there's this worry that you're, you know, making work in response to a place that you've kind of gone into. And if it's not official, what happens, you know, is it, can something come back or yeah. can something happen? I'm not quite sure, but it does then often, or also the downside of that, it takes out the spontaneity of just going to a place and exploring and seeing what happens. Yeah. Um, yeah. Having to be a bit of, of a responsible adult about it. <laughs> Yes, yeah, it does like, oh, that's boring. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's probably still pretty exciting though, yeah. Well, I want to make sure that we have time to talk about as well Bristol Print Atelier, which you started earlier this year with some collaborators. It seems like a heck of a year to take something like this on. Why now? How did this come to happen? So this yeah, this year has been like a year like none, no other at all. And 
it's but for me it's actually been it's it's been a year full of collaboration and projects so as well as the atelier i'm doing a project um with wwf um on deforestation which we can touch on in a minute but the atelier uh that kind of came around june july and before the atelier i was in my own studio at a place called estate of the arts which is an old industrial warehouse in bristol and I had my own unit, but, you know, I filled it extremely fast. I think as printmakers, we are also very good at collecting stuff. You know, if someone's getting rid of it, you're like, oh, I'll have that. You, you just don't know when it's going to come in handy or, or good use. So I was kind of filling out of that space. And the two printmakers that I've set up the atelier with, we all met on the Masters in Bristol. And we just, just a discussion being like, oh, I really would love a bigger space. And they were like, well, we want a bigger space. So we went about looking for buildings and um, property to set up a print studio in. And the one we're in now used to be an old enameling factory and it's been divided up into industrial spaces. So we've got quite a big unit with two etching presses, um, a lithography press, dark room slash acid room kind of multi-purpose space and it's it's just a great place to be able to develop our own work also working in collaboration not in collaboration but working with other printmakers not in isolation is a really key um to developing your own practice because what they do is completely different to you and you're learning all the time which i think is a lovely thing about printmaking is it is this continual learning journey yeah uh, so yeah We'll primarily use the space for our own work, but from January, we're going to be offering workshops and courses for people. So we'll start teaching the traditional elements of printmaking, which we don't want to lose this kind of traditional skill to try and keep it alive, basically. Since lockdown, there's been another lithography studio open up in Bristol. So I feel like that is on the rise, which is fantastic news. Because uh, at one point it's looking a bit sparse in the UK, yeah, you know, turning around, which is brilliant. It's so I feel like for me it's so hard to get a sense of how popular printmaking is or isn't because I just feel like like well whenever I turn around there's another printmaker, you know, because <laughs> of the 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 world that I'm in. But I do hear from people, just kind of generally through interviews, through chatting with people that they have seen last 10 years, last five years, a bit of an uptick in in interest, in shops opening, in people getting together to start places where they can work together and work collaboratively. I'm sure the internet has actually done quite nicely for printmaking, as we talked about before. That dramatic oh. reveal m- makes for good Instagramming every time. Exactly. And I think because we are so oversaturated with technology, people want to kind of go back and do something hands on and creative. A lot of the courses that we run or that I'm I'm used to running with Bristol Print Collective, we often got people who were just wanting to do something different from their day job and switch off and make with their hands, which, you know, we don't often get a chance to do anymore because it is so tech heavy. Um, You know, we're just in this forever continual digital world and if you're not careful, you just get sucked into it. Yeah, and even sometimes when people are invited to do something creative like writing, that still ends up you're staring at a screen. And so you're just staring at a screen from the moment you wake up and you check the news to all day at work to your fun class at the end of the day to checking the news before you go to sleep it's worrying but that's why I think there's been a resurgence in the handmade is because people are realizing this and you know they want to to do something creative as an outlet and the way that we so I mentioned Bristol Print Collective and before the Atelier run co-run a collective where we popped up in different locations and taught DIY printmaking so printmaking that people could then do at home so using a pasta maker or a die cutter oh. as a press and it's just so that people can understand kind of break down the so we, when you go into a big print studio you it's often quite overwhelming with the the size of the press and the chemicals that go with it but when you then really limit it and strip it down and be like actually you can make a dry point plate on an old tetra pack carton and use a pasta maker you know that that is a really nice gateway into printmaking 
for people because it it kind of it stops this pressure of you know having to produce something amazing in a print studio when actually you can just dabble at home on your kitchen table um and it's those people then that will come back and do more workshops and will sign up to maybe a weekend in etching or because you've broken down that barrier and that question of well where when will i use this again you know yes. um is it like no you you have options i i had a a great husband wife couple who ran tres gatos press and they talked to me and ronaldo gil zambrano for one of our double release episodes and they're famous for using a tortilla press like oh, it's just something you'd find yeah. in yeah almost any mexican home and they they make prints that way so the everything is printmaking model i i always love yeah and so what about this project with WWF that you're doing? Yeah, so this, again, this was born in lockdown. I mean, if COVID hadn't have hit, I would not have done any of these projects because I was caught up in a fast-paced kind of environment working. So when, you know, I was almost forced to pause and stop, WWF had got in contact um, beforehand just saying about getting on board with them and helping promote how the food we eat and our commodities how that impacts deforestation basically Mm. but during lockdown obviously my I had this time to really think about priorities and almost your moral obligations as an artist how you can use that for good so this project is with a printmaker in Glasgow called James Harrison so we are producing a series of interactive prints so he's green printing with glow in the dark pigment that charges in the daytime and then glows in the dark Mm. which is insane and then on top I'm producing a lithograph and when the lights are off all the kind of habitat comes through the lithograph because he's in Glasgow and I'm in Bristol you know that's like a nine hour drive away yeah Uh, posting backwards and forwards um prints which has been fun in lockdown you know kind of thinking about how we can collaborate and use both our skill sets together to create this kind of powerful piece. And alongside the prints, there's going to be a film made, which kind of touches on the process, but also how people can make positive change to kind of help stop the Amazon going on, you know, stop it from tipping over to the point of no return, basically. So it's been an interesting project because for me, although I, you know, I've, I grew up in the countryside, so I've always been connected to nature. But, you know, during lockdown, that was my comfort was going for walks and mm. kind of reconnecting to the natural world. And as I was doing so, I was almost realising that how disconnected I had become. You know, you're on a treadmill when you're working. You're just constantly you know, printing, working in different cities. And so, yeah, I kind of started doing more research into habitat loss. And when you start researching, there's no going back. And once you almost start to gain all this information, it's hard then to not take action. And this print series is kind of my way of taking action and trying to have a positive message put out there. And did you say that it was related to diets or or how people consume what they eat as well? Yeah, so it's it's it will touch on diet and going vegan is well not going vegan but trying to be as plant based as possible is is one of the kind of main ways that you can help deforestation or help climate change kind of stop that impact. So it will be a lot about yeah kind of diet and how how ma- mainly the rainforest is being destroyed for soy plantations to be built and the soy isn't for even us to eat it's for the you know it's for cattle yeah. and farming so. Yeah, it will be linked to to diet and how we can, you know, just make one change can make a huge impact and difference. But yeah. it's the fact that we can try and do it together. So full disclosure, I've been vegan on and off for 16 years. So like I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of a, I'm a very, I'm someone who takes diet really seriously and in terms of the impact that it has on the environment and you know, I'm mostly vegan now, you know, I'll eat maybe some sustainably farmed fish here and there, you know, but it's something that is really important to me, but it's also interesting to me how reactionary people get to it, how defensive they get 
And I don't know yet the best way to communicate it because I've been doing this for 16 years. Oh, no, sorry. No, I started when I was 16 and I'm 36. So that's 20 years. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I've been because I've been vegan, vegetarian, you know, off and on because, you know, there's just been times in my life where I, I couldn't afford it or I was living somewhere where it wasn't feasible for one reason or another because of like cultural things or staying with a host family that doesn't understand and, you know, all these different reasons yeah. that life happens. But when I can, I've, I've been vegan and vegetarian. And because I've been doing it for 20 years, I have heard just about every excuse and reaction under the sun to it. And it's what I've sort of settled on now is just telling people, look, you don't have to eat salads three meals a day for the rest of your life, even cutting out meat one day a week, two days a week, every other day, switching to eating meat one day a week. I mean, eat, switching to fish and chicken over beef. Like, you don't have to make this extreme life change. You can just make a few changes and cut your carbon footprint dramatically. And if everybody does that that is when we see chances for the world to heal. And I think, um, you know, with COVID-19, there's this direct link that, you know, people, surely it's, you know, because we're going through this pandemic, um, there is a definite kind of link to that, the, you know, the pandemics, people going into places that aren't used to being explored and bringing back diseases. Mm. And, you know, the health, you know, the health of our planet, it reflects the health of us as human beings, and I'm hoping that almost like this pandemic could be as a wake up call. You know, we're in this real pivotal moment where change can happen quite easily because, you know, it's been made evident that change has to happen. And, you know, climate change, if it doesn't, if we don't solve it, it's the biggest threat to, you know, a, an extinction of human beings, which is really worrying. And hopefully people get on board and you know like you were saying just one cut out meat one day a week will have a massive impact yeah and and that's the thing too that the planet doesn't really care if we live or die as a species like no. this is <laughs> the you know we've gone through massive extinctions before and the planet has healed and incredible varieties of life, both plants and animals have sprung forth and populated the earth. So, you know, it's it's this, we need to save the planet, but we really need to save our own asses is what's happening right now. <laughs> like The author called Mike Davis and it's called Dead Cities. And it mm. was written in 2002, but it was like a projection of how long it would last for you, for nature to get the upper hand and to destroy any evidence of human trace. And they predict like 500 years, which, you know, uh, actually it links back to the recordings of an abandoned building because plant life is thriving. And it's kind of um, quite comforting to know that if we do fuck up the planet, at least nature will still thrive. Mm. And in 500 years, there'll be no evidence we were here. Yeah. Which, yeah. <laughs> Which, you know, in a very grim way, like there is definitely a comfort in that, that, yeah. that, that things go that. on and that, you know, energy isn't destroyed and, and we, you know, we, we had a shot as these sort of silly upright apes and maybe yeah. we'll, maybe we'll make it work and maybe we won't. One of my absolute heroes is David Attenborough. I love him so much. I love his work so much. I like the very first DVD set I ever got was, you know, I think it was Planet Earth. I've got like all kinds of plans for like a memorial tattoo for him. Like, you know, when we lose that national treasure, global treasure, like I just I really, really love his work. And he does have a new series out that's on Netflix and I think you can watch it for free on YouTube as well. And it yeah. uh, it's just called A Life on Our Planet. And he, he basically takes his own lifetime because I think he's almost 90 if he's not, you know, early 90s. And yeah. it, it just breaks down how just within his lifetime, the amount of deforestation that's happened, the amount of carbon that's in the air that's changed. And he gives very practical things that you can do to change it and 
carefully and calmly lays out the argument that we have to do something right now. I think, um, yeah, I have seen that documentary and it was so powerful. And if he can't persuade people to make change and difference, I don't know who can. Mm -hmm. And it's going back to that, like, how do you communicate with people that change has to happen in order for us to continue as a race? Um, Is that kind of driving home that message that every that every fire we see on TV or in the news, it isn't a distant problem. It's it's taking us close to that tipping point and us becoming extinct, mm-hmm. which is frightening. But yeah, just making work and printing and you know, that's, I think, a way art can be a very powerful tool is to push those positive messages out there and for people to engage in a kind of a global issue. Yeah, art has the power to connect with people and deliver messages emotionally in a way that just staring at a graph, it just never will. You know, you can nice. you can look at numbers that say, you know, within David Attenborough's lifetime, we've gone from like 70% of our natural forest to 30% or something like that. But they're just numbers, you know? <laughs> it's... It, it, yeah, it's art that allows us to understand the emotional realities of it. So I'm so glad you have that project. I didn't expect that we'd get a chance to to dive into it and I'd get to stand up on my vegan soapbox here. Um, yeah. But I'm so glad we did because it's it's the thing that is going to define the next century. And I think we're very wrapped up in COVID right now. But the yes. second that... effective vaccines start spreading around and life goes back to normal. This is what everyone will be looking at. I really, truly hope that this is what will happen. And, And even down to the fact that this pandemic is here because of the way we treat animals that we eat. And the way we treat our planet, you know, I think there needs to also be that shift in terminology, not the planet, but our planet, because we should be living in harmony, not, you know, just cutting it down and using it as a resource. Do we live in a world, we live in a, uh, you know, the the times we're living in is that a tree is worth more to us cut down than it is, Mm -hmm. is living, which is, yeah, what you were, going back to what you were saying, it's, you know, hopefully people take, you know, look at this pandemic and, make change from it and positive change yeah i really hope so and i'm so glad that you have this project and that you're doing the work and and we got to talk about it this has just been really delightful to learn more about you and your practice and i know that you've said you've you've been to bangkok before but there's great great printmaking here so please come visit me sometime once the borders open up (laughs) yeah that'd be amazing and and likewise if you ever find yourself in the uk do swing by the atelier oh i would um, love that yeah absolutely i've actually never been to the uk i've I've been all over Uh europe and asia and australia but it's where my a lot of my family's from and of course you know my hero David Attenborough so I, I really yeah, think I need to go it's it's very very high up there on my international travel list so I hope we get a chance to connect in person sometime in the next years here I'm sure we will because the printmaking world the more you get into it you realize it's quite small it's um, so small it's small but really lovely because you have you know friends and family all over the world which is the nice thing about being in printmaking Absolutely. You always have a home if there's a press. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. You have a bed if there's a bed, right? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Just pop a pillow when I'm watching press sorted. I'm sure it's been done. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure it's been done. Well, Gemma, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me and and telling me about your your process and your projects. Um, It's really been delightful it's been, it's been my pleasure it's been yeah um absolutely love talking to you thank you for the invitation oh this has been great i will be in touch um as things start to sort of come out and probably asking you for you know an image or two to to help promote but um yeah thank you again i hope you have a wonderful afternoon in bristol and um i hope that we get to keep in contact and keep talking Well, that's our show for this week. Join me again next week when my guest will be Bryn Parrott. 
who you probably know as Dear Jerk. Need I say more? This episode, like all episodes, was written and produced by me, Miranda Metcalf, with editing by Timothy Pauschak and music by Joshua Weber. I'll see you next week. Thank you.